Well, good morning, everyone. Well, if you haven't met me before, my name is Dilan Jassing. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're going to spend some time, as Ed mentioned, um, going back to the beginning, going back to the beginning. And you would have received an outline, so you can take some notes if you'd like to. Um, there'll be some slides that will come up on the screen as well. But before we uh, come to God's word, allow me to lead us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the privilege of sitting under your word. And Lord, this morning we thank you for the power of your word. And we pray, Lord, that we will submit to you because the power of the word comes from you. So Father, may you work in our hearts, work in our minds, shaping us, molding us, Lord, restoring us, healing us through your spirit. And we pray that all this would happen for your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know about your favorite superhero, uh, but every superhero has a backstory, right? Uh, a story of origin. Now, for example, Spider-Man, right? Who knows the backstory of the Spider-Man? Bitten by a spider, a radioactive spider. That's where he gets all his uh, superhuman spider powers and abilities. And Genesis, as we come to Genesis, Genesis is about the story of origins. It is the very first book of the Bible, and it tells us how it all began. It tells us the backstory of the universe, the world, family, faith, marriage, community, life, and death. Genesis tells us of our family tree, how it all began, how it all went wrong. Then it traces how God chooses one family, one nation, to restore what went wrong. How through one family, God would raise a savior to restore the whole humanity. In other words, Genesis is also the backstory for Jesus, the salvation that we have through Jesus. So this term, we are going to spend some time in Genesis chapter 1 to 11. And then we are going to come back to it next year uh, in, in term 1, hopefully, uh, unless Jesus returns before that. Uh, we'll ask all the questions from him there. Um, so that's how we're going to do it. So today we come to Genesis chapter 1. Now I realize this chapter is huge. It has a lot of information. I mean, the, the creation of the whole universe is captured in, in one chapter. Now how could you do that? Now, we won't have the time to go through all the information, so I'm not going to do that this morning. And I also realize people have different views of Genesis, or the first chapter of Genesis, about how creation happened, how everything came to be. Uh, evolution, or the Big Bang Theory, or God, did God create the whole universe in six literal days, or did he, did he create that in six million years? But I'm not going to dwell on those this morning. Because the primary interest of the writer of Genesis is that we meet God. We meet the creator. So rather than telling us how the creation happened, I mean, there's some information of how things happen, but the writer is more interested in telling us about who created. See for yourself. An angel is going to come and read the Bible for us. And in your outline, uh, there's a question. To raise the question. You get the question? No. There you go. Uh, count how many times you see the word God appear in this reading. So Angel is going to come and read, and as he reads, uh, just maybe if you want to highlight or uh, make a note of it, that'd be good. Thanks, Angela. Uh, good morning, church. As you've just heard, I'll be reading Genesis. I'll be reading all of chapter one and the first three verses of chapter two. 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the borders. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear, and it was so. God called the dry ground land, and gathered the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit, with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so, the land produced vegetation, plants, plant bearing seeds according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and the days and the years and let them and let them bear the lights of the vault to the sky to give light to the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created great creatures of the sea, and every living thing which the water teems, and that moves above it, and uh, above it, in it. According to the kinds, and every winged bird, and according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds over the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on, moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath 
of life in it. I give every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all, all he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Angelo. Um, so, how many? 31, 32, 33. Okay, I think I might have missed one. I counted 32. There you go. Um, but then there are mentions of God in terms of he and I. So if you count all those, God appears all over the text, doesn't he? Now why? Why does the writer insert God all over the text? Because he wants the readers, us, to know and worship the true God. The God of the Bible, Elohim, as he as is called in the Hebrew. The God Almighty. He wants us to come to him and find purpose and meaning for our life. Perhaps that was the question people were asking back then. Who is this God who created the heavens and the earth? What should we do before him? So what can we learn about God from this chapter? That's what we're going to do this morning. Again, there are so many things we can learn about God, but I want to briefly focus on just four attributes of God from this passage. And then I want to talk about what is the end goal of creation. So where is thing that we are confronted is that our God, the God of the Bible, is the eternal God. If you have your Bibles, have a look at verse 1 of Genesis chapter 1. It says, in the beginning God. In the beginning, God. Before time, space, and matter came to be, God was there. There's no beginning nor end to God. God is not created. There was never a time where, when God was not there, and there's never, there will never be a time where God will cease to exist. He sits outside time, which means there's, there's no time constraints for God. He doesn't get old as we do with time. He doesn't get gray hair and he doesn't get uh, kind of outdated over time. Now imagine you went to see the Anzac Parade in, in, Anzac parade in, in, uh, in April, the, the, the procession. And imagine you are seated on a, on a high position and then you see uh, these, these marching bands and people passing by you and, and then uh, they come and go. We just see that, don't we? But God sees the whole parade. Like he has kind of got onto a, got, got onto a, a helicopter and, and he just hovers over it. Now extend that idea to the whole universe. That everything happens in the universe in this moment and, and every moment. God sees all those. Now, you know, we, we, we simply can't get our head around, right? The infiniteness, the eternalness of our God. But that's just a glimpse of what it means to have an eternal God. He, he knows the end from the beginning. There's nothing hidden from him. They, he, he knows our past, our, our, our present, our future. He knows everything. It's just in, in like a single picture. So if he is the eternal God, uh, then we must humble ourselves before him, don't we? We must not act as if we know it all, because we don't. We must submit ourselves to his wisdom and his will and his care, and we must worship him. 
So we, have, we are confronted with this, this eternal God in the first couple of word, words in the Bible. The second attribute that we come across in, this, in these verses is we've got a God who is the creator God. The creator God. Verse 1 continues, In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created. The Hebrew word for created uh, describes creating something out of nothing. Verse 2 says, nothing existed. It was formless. It was empty, dark, waterlogged. And verses 3 to 31, we, we see the first working week of, of history, isn't it? That God goes to work. Creating everything out of nothing. Every day builds upon the previous day. And something new is created every day. And finally, on the sixth day, as the pinnacle of, of God's creation, God creates man and woman in his own image. And we will look at that next week in more detail as we focus on, on day six. But the point is, we have a God who creates. Create things out of nothing. He creates life, he creates beauty, he creates order, purpose. He creates boundaries, doesn't he? Imagine this watch. It's a, it's a smart watch. It has got pieces, and then imagine one day I take this apart. I piece by piece, all the pieces, I put it in a bag and I shake it. I shake it for six million years. What are the chances of me getting the same watch in this order? I would say zero. Same with this whole universe, isn't it? There's no chance that this creation, this, this complex creation happened by chance. Just like this watch had a designer, a, a, a creator behind it, someone who is intelligent, purposeful behind it, the whole universe begs for an intelligent, purposeful, powerful creator. It is hard, it is impossible to explain the, the complexities and, and all the tiny, minute details, how all works together without any problem. Now we must wonder, how did God create? And this is one of the things that this, this, uh, that this passage kind of explains. He says, notice, uh, notice in this passage, each day begins with the words, each day begins with the words, God said. God said, and things happened. God says something, and things happen. Things that didn't exist begin to appear. Things that couldn't simply happen start happening when God spoke. Now, God's word ha has power, but the power of the word did not come from the content or, or anything, anything supernatural in that word. There's no magical content of the word. It comes from the person who speaks, God, isn't it? It's like if you come to our place, you will be greeted by our dog, Benji. He will run all over you. You can, you can, you can scream at him from the top of your lungs and, and ask him to sit. He wouldn't because he wants to lick you. He wants to jump all over you. But if Faustin and I goes to him and says, sit, he listens because he knows where his food comes from. <laughs> when God spoke, creation obeys. Things happen because he is the boss, the creator God. Everything in creation depends on God for their life, for their existence. So in a sense, the writer is saying, don't worship the creation. Don't worship the created things. I mean, marvel at them, but don't worship them. Don't worship idols. Look beyond Look at the creator. You and I have 
the God who creates the whole universe and God who sustains it by the power of his words. Worship the creator God. And third, we find in these verses the God of the universe, a universal God. Now, one of the common reasons why uh, people, especially people from uh, non-Western countries, why they don't believe in God of the Bible is they, they kind of say, well, this, this God is the God of the West. They're the God of, God of the, he's the God of the Christians. Uh, they might even say, well, he's the God of the white man. But if you go back to the creation story, what we hear is God of the Bible is not, he he doesn't belong to any nation, any people group, because none of them existed back then to start with. Verse 1 continues, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It simply says God created the heavens and the earth. Even when he created humans later on, he didn't create them into a nation or or a people group. See, he's the God of the whole universe. And the interesting fact of the Bible is, I don't know whether you realize this, the Bible begins with the whole world in focus of God. The focus of God is the whole world. And if you go back to the last chapter of the Bible, uh, the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, what is the focus? The world, the nations, every tongue and tribe worshipping God. And indeed, if you you read John 3.16, God didn't love just one nation. No, God loves the whole world. And he sends his son Jesus so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. See, whether, whether, people, whether people believe him or not, he's the God of every man and woman. Regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their language, regardless where they come from, what work they do, he's the God of every creature. He's the God of the whole universe who who deserves to be worshipped. We have the God who is eternal. We have the God who is the creator. We have the God who is universal. And we find the God who is good. A good God. Now I quite enjoy mowing lawns. When we came back from holidays, I had to do a bit of work, getting our lawns back in order. So once I've done that, once I've mowed the lawns, and then once I've done the trimming on, on the, the edges and, and swept everything, one of the things I like doing is just, just sit back and just say, wow, what a beautiful lawn that is, right? Maybe you, you don't enjoy lawn mowing, but you might enjoy cooking. You might enjoy baking something or painting or uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe pressure washing the footpath. And then you might sit back and say, wow, yes, I, I really like what I did there. You know, it, it looks good. And as you read these, these uh, verses, one of the things that we find is God doing just that, isn't it? At the end of each day, God, I don't know, I, I can picture uh, God folding his hands and he just, just looks at everything and says, wow, I, I like what I did there. It's good. It's beautiful. It, it fits the purpose. I, I quite like it. Now, at the end of day six, when, when God created man and woman, and, and, and he includes man and woman in creation, and, and he, he looks at the creation and he says, this is very good. Sometimes we think, right, we think, well, man came, the creation was good, man came, and we we kind of destroyed the creation. No, with man, the creation was very good. It fits the purpose. 
So we must pause here and remember, uh, before evil, pain, and disorder, chaos entered into the world, what God made was good. It is good. Everything worked perfectly. There was harmony. It was pleasant. Creation before it was marred by, by sin was good. The boundaries God had kept were good. The distinction between light and darkness, day and night, sea and land, fish, birds and the animals, indeed the distinction between man and woman, that was good. That was good. Why were all these good? Because we have a good God, don't we? He's good. His plans are good. His, his desire is good. His will is good. His wisdom is to do good, not to harm his creation. Because he is a good God. And although it is not anywhere near how God created it to be, there is still beauty and wonder and awe in God's creation, right? The sun rises and the sun sets, the flowers and amazing, the amazing complexity of the human body. I just, just take a flower and then just see how beautiful that is. And it is a reminder for us each time, our God is good. He gives good things. He created everything good. And we must remember the goodness of God and worship him. And you might wonder, so what is the point? What is the point of creation? Why did God create all these things? Why did God create all these things in six days and, and humans? And what is the point? What is the end goal of creation? Now, chapter 2, verse 2, on the seventh day, we are told that God finished the work he had been doing. And he rested from all his work. And he makes the seventh day different. He makes it special than the other six days. In the first six days, it was busy. It was exciting. It was all good things were happening. And then verse 3 continues, God blessed the seventh day. He made it holy. He, he set it apart than from all the other days. And on that day, he rested from all the creation work that he had done. Now, do you notice, did you notice, unlike all the other days, day seven doesn't end. And every other day begins, it's at the end, it's there was morning and evening. Day seven doesn't end. There's no evening. In that sense, God's rest continues Till today. Now we must understand well, God did not need a rest like we do after, after a hard day's work. I mean, uh, the Bible says our God does not grow weary or tired, He does not sleep nor slumber. But if God did not need a rest like we do, why did he create the last day, a special day, a day of rest, a holy day? Why, why does he continue to have a rest day? As, as we continue to read the Bible, uh, we begin to see this rest, which is also called the Sabbath rest is much more than God resting on his own. Right? Now we see the seventh day rest or the Sabbath day rest is extended to all his creation, all his people. God invites his people to rest with him. For example, the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, says these words. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. 
On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your maid, male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the seas and all that in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. God commands his people to observe the Sabbath. It becomes a day when God's people had to stop and reflect and delight in God, to, to, to stop and worship God. It becomes a day when God's people had to stop trusting in themselves, in what they can do. Remember the story of, of, of manna? coming in the desert, he says, okay, six days you, you collect everything, but on the seventh day, don't collect anything. Why? Because I'm going to provide. What does that mean? Trust in me. Trust in me. Trust in what I will do. When we come to the New Testament in the book of Hebrews, I was trying to get a specific verse. No, I think you need to read the whole chapter of Hebrews chapter 4 to get this picture of the rest that the Bible talks about. We are reminded in, in Hebrews chapter 4 that this rest or the Sabbath rest is much more than uh, ceasing from work for just one day and then going to the temple or, or to the church. It is an invitation for ongoing relationship with the eternal, everlasting, creator, universal, good God. You see, friends, God is not after religion. God is not after us following rules and regulations. No, he's after a relationship. He's after a relationship. And how do we have this relationship with God? Because we will look at it next, in, in a couple of weeks' time, because this relationship with God was broken because of sin. And the book of Hebrews says we enter into this relationship with God, not by trusting in our own deeds, not by trusting in our own way to get there. No, we enter into this relationship with God, this new covenant by trusting in what he has done through his son Jesus. The work that Jesus did 2,000 years ago on the cross has enabled us to have a relationship with him. And this is the end goal of creation. Rest. Rest in God. The eternal, creator, universal, good God rests so we can enter into his rest. So we can enter into a relationship with him and we can worship him forever. Now, in a moment, we are going to take part in communion. We eat the bread and we drink from the cup. It is a reminder for us that, that sin was the barrier for us to have a relationship with God, for us to enter into this rest that God talks about. That 2,000 years ago, on a cross, God did all the work on our behalf so that we can have a relationship with him. As we break the bread and eat, uh, eat it, and as we drink from the cup, we remember the death of Jesus on a cruel cross. We remember that Jesus' death was the final and the full payment that enabled us to enter into a permanent relationship, permanent rest in God. It is a reminder for us that we who have believed in Jesus are in that rest. To remind us Yes, rest in him. Cast all your burdens, cast all your anxieties on him. 
is a reminder for us to do that. The eternal creator, universal good God rests. He invites us to rest in him. And those who have trusted in Jesus have a relationship with God, a relationship that we can call him Father, isn't it? That is the wonderful rest that we can have, to rest in the presence of our Father. So if you have believed in Jesus, let me invite you to come and take part in communion. Celebrate the fact that you have entered into the rest that God has called you to. And if you haven't believed in Jesus, the invitation is still open. The invitation to enter into the rest is still open. And the writer of the Hebrews says, he says, like, don't be disobedient. Don't put off that invitation. Don't ignore that invitation to trust in Jesus and enter into the rest. Let us take a moment to reflect on, on these before we take part in communion. Perhaps maybe you want to take a moment to thank God and maybe ask forgiveness for the times that we have doubted this rest doubted our relationship with God. Perhaps ask God to help you to trust in Jesus. So let's do that before we come to take part in communion.